Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Everything that move. I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. Go. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown. You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week, and we have got our first NFC East preview of the 2019 season as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 196. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with Mark Bullock from The Athletic, who is a great analyst for the Washington Redskins. Does a great job covering that team, especially from an All-22 standpoint. He's one of my favorite followers on Twitter when it comes to a team-centric All-22 analysis. Mark does a great job. He joins us to really kind of kick a series off where before each of the team's first three preseason games this summer, we're going to take a look ahead to our divisional foes. So we're going to do Washington this week, I think we'll do New York next week and Dallas the week after that. Just give the Eagles fans a primer going into the fall. Let's start things off now with Mark in Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. Well, really excited this week to welcome in Mark Bullock from The Athletic. He covers the Washington Redskins and is a, does a, just a great job of breaking them down from an all-22 standpoint. And Mark, wanted to bring you onto the show. Just give our listeners a little bit of a preview, not just to the Week 1 matchup, to, but also to one of the biggest division rivals for the Eagles in the Washington Redskins. And I guess first off, we're in the middle of training camp right now. What is the biggest storyline for this Washington football team at this point in the summer? Yeah, the biggest storyline, you'd think with a rookie quarterback, it would be about the rookie quarterback. But uh, at the moment, it's uh, the Trent Williams situation. It's, sure. uh, it's a big cloud over everything. Um, and you kind of, we've forgotten about the quarterback battle um, almost completely, but it's still in there. But with, with Trent Williams uh, being the, the biggest player, the best player on the team, um, and holding out and reports are kind of mixed of is it about him wanting a new contract and it being the best time for him to kind of get his last payday or is it something to do with the medical team is it a bit of both it's kind of it's kind of mixed about exactly what's going on there so that's that's undoubtedly that's the biggest story so I guess the the big question for you next is because you know, we're going to get to the quarterback situation in a little bit what is the biggest concern for this team right now is it the Trent Williams situation or is there another area that might be a little bit more worrisome for that group no, for sure, it's uh, it's Trent Williams situation. Yeah. Uh, that that puts a doubt over everything. Um, that the left tackle spot without Trent Williams. Uh, in pre- in previous years, they've had Ty Inseki, who's been able to step in, and he did phenomenally. Um, and in retrospect, with with the way that this is all played out, I'm sure they would have loved to have done a better job of trying to keep Inseki. But they let him walk, and he's gone to Buffalo. Um, and so they started training camp with. Eric Flowers, um, the former Giants left tackle, playing left tackle for them, and he was just getting beat. He was only signed to as an experiment to try at left guard, um, but he never got a chance to play left guard because they needed a tackle. Um, now they've got Garon Christian, um, who they drafted in the third round last year, um, and they liked his athleticism. He played. He was a swing tackle um, at Louisville. He played both right and left side, so they liked him as a project to sort of replace Inseki this year, but he lacks functional play strength. He, in his few opportunities last year, he got bulldozed over way too easily. Um, and so he's, um, and then he got injured. So he hasn't really had much of a chance this year, this off season to develop because he's been rehabbing. So he's, he's now just getting back into training and, and he's playing with the ones right now. Um, they signed Donald Penn as kind of their emergency backup option. Right. Um, and so there's thoughts of like, does Penn take over? I would I would assume probably at some point once he's up to speed, I would think Penn takes over. But um, with with Trent Williams not there, it's kind of a mess right now. Yeah, I think I had read a quote from Donald Penn that he signed there to start. So I would assume that that is the plan uh, for yes. him moving forward. Uh, for let sure. me ask you this question: what, what are the strongest position groups for this team? What are the strengths of the Washington Redskins going into 2019? Uh, well, if Trent Williams was there, you'd say the offensive line. Um, but with it, that, with that situation being up in the air, uh, it's definitely the, the defensive line. Um, the, they love the top three guys, obviously. Yep. Uh, Jonathan Allen, 
uh, Deron Payne, first round picks from Alabama. Uh, Matt Ioannidis has come on leaps and bounds. He got his contract extension done early, um, and they're thrilled with that. Um, and he's underrated, but he's sneakily just as good as the other two. Um, but they also like the depth they have there. Tim Settle was a rookie um, last year. He was a, a day three pick, um, and they, they liked what he had, and he's coming in much better shape this offseason. Um, and he he figures to uh, to fit in on that rotation a little bit more this year. Um, and Caleb Brantley uh, was a guy they picked up from the Browns after they cut him last year. Um, and uh, he's kind of figures to be the fifth guy in the rotation. Um, and he was kind of uh, he was hardly thought of in college as a pass rush specialist. And he's uh, he kind of had a stunted development in Cleveland, but they they like what what he brings to the team and. Last year, they, they cut Ziggy Hood, who was a kind of a reliable defensive end rotational guy, um, to keep Brantley. So um, they, they like that group, and that's definitely their, their strongest group. Yeah, I mean, when you've got guys like Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne, you have an an itis that you mentioned, uh, the former Temple kid. Uh, you know, Deron Payne, uh, to me, was one of the elite players in that 2018 draft, and I, I was not happy uh, to see him end up in Washington. <laughs> he had a really strong rookie season. So, yeah, I would agree. That's probably a strength of that team moving into this season. So let's get to the depth chart because I, I think this is, is really interesting starting at quarterback, and we'll just kind of go through these positions quickly, position by position. You know, we, we see quarterback chem- competitions all the time in the NFL, in college, usually two-man competitions. We don't often see a three-man competition, and that seems yeah. to be what's what's going on right now with uh, Jay Gruden and the Redskins. Yeah, for sure. It is definitely a three-man competition, um, and the, the depth chart that they released to a media thing yesterday um, was, you know, that they never really care about those, but it had McCoy listed as the starter, um, and... That's probably just because he has the most experience with the offense, um, and he's been there five years. And Jay Gruden's always really liked him, um, and the feeling around DC is they've always really wanted to give him a shot. And every time he's got a shot, he's got injured within a game or two, so uh, he's never really had a, an extended go at it. Um, Case Keenum is at two because he's the veteran and he's been in the NFL, um, and then they've got Haskins listed as, as three just, just purely because he's a rookie. Um, Haskins does have a ways to go. Um, he, he still flashes his potential, and, and obviously he's the future of the franchise. Um, but it seems like he's taken a while to get acclimated to the whole process of calling a play at college. He, he rarely had to call a long, wordy play call, whereas Jay Gruden and that West Coast offense is known for those 10 to 15 word play calls. So um, getting into the huddle and, and spitting out those long play calls and, and then, you know, getting everyone aligned properly before you even look at the defense, it, it takes some getting used to. So I, I think that's kind of where Haskins is right now. Um, and so, yeah, probably McCoy and, and Keenum are more likely to start at this stage. And I, I would suggest probably McCoy just slightly edges it because he has that experience in the system. Yeah, you wrote a really cool piece uh, for mo- on Monday for The Athletic just highlighting what that play call might look like for Dwayne Haskins. Uh, let me ask you this. You mentioned it's probably going to be Colt McCoy. It probably should be Colt McCoy for week one when these two teams play. What do you think for the second time these two? Do you think knowing what you know about this team and, and how the season may go, uh, Haskins' development and the coaches' trust in him, do you feel like he's got a shot to be the starter by the time they face the Eagles a second time? I would think that... Haskins will play at some point this year. Yeah. Um, the the only reason I would say that he wouldn't would be if they were like, in if they got off to an absolute flyer or if they had uh, like a, a good chance of making the playoffs and it had been Keenum or McCoy the whole way and you know there's f- five or six games left and they're in a good chance with the playoffs if, if at least the wild card they'll probably be looking for like Jay Gruden specifically will be looking will be coaching for his job so he'll be wanting a guy that he can trust and he wouldn't wouldn't want to go to Haskins too early but um that would I would guess that was probably be somewhat unlikely given that you're looking at either Colt McCoy or Case Keenan being your starting quarterback so I would have thought at some point Haskins will get a shot and you know if it's if they start poorly then I, I would I would think that's sooner rather than later all right, well, let's uh, stay in the backfield. Let's go to running back. The team spent a second-round pick on Darius Geis a year ago. He missed all of his rookie season with that ACL that he suffered last summer in the preseason. Uh, so Adrian Peterson was signed. He ended up starting all last year. Is still listed as the starter. Darius Geis, number two. Uh, renowned Eagles killer Chris Thompson, the veteran, uh, one of the best third-down backs in the NFL. He is the number three. Pretty strong group overall as long as everybody's healthy. Obviously, Adrian Peterson a little bit older. Geis coming off the injury, and it seemed like there were 
you know some uh, rumors about complications there with guys. Uh, what are your thoughts overall? Any notes sort of, that you've got on this group entering the season? Yeah, it's probably the the second strongest position group. Um, obviously, Adrian Peterson's going to be a Hall of Famer, um, and he should take the top of the depth chart. But I, I think there will be plenty of carries for Geis, and if Geis does well, like this offense last year was built to be something for Geis and Thompson to split. And when Geis went down, then Adrian Peterson took over and they kind of had to adjust. But I think looking forward, they want Geis to be the guy. Um, and that's why you spend the second round pick on him to be the guy. And he has the plenty of talent and ability to be the guy. And he can be more than just the runner that we saw uh, in college. He, he's Gruden's constantly praised his ability to catch out of the backfield. So um, they've not had a guy that can do both. They usually have Thompson, as you say, he's one of the best third down backs in the league. So um, usually Thompson's the guy that does that. And then they have another workhorse back to do to come in on first and second down. Um, so I think we'll start off with Peterson. We'll certainly get plenty. Um, but I, I think Geis will eventually assume probably the, the majority of the carries and then Thompson come in on third down. Um, and Gruden has constantly this offseason praised Samaje Pirine, who was a fourth rounder the year before. Um, and he had some fumble problems early in his year, uh, in his career. Um, but he, um, Gruden has constantly praised his, his work ethic and, and has taken the blame himself for not getting Pirine enough carries. So um, they, they think Pirine could contribute to the team as well. I'm glad the, the door's not shut on him. I like P. Ryan coming out of Oklahoma a couple of years ago. And, and the NFC, surely uh, not having a shortage of young, talented running backs when you look at all four teams in the division. Let's look at the wide receiver position. And this has been a much talked about group for this Washington football team. You've got Josh Doxson, a former first round pick, hasn't quite lived up to that mantle. They signed Paul Richardson in free agency last year, uh, a speedster out of Seattle. They draft Trey Quinn in the seventh round a year ago. He's now the starter in the slot. And it seems Seems like uh, uh, Jay Gruden cannot say enough good things about Trey Quinn. And then they've got a couple of draft picks. Kelvin Harmon from N NC State, but they drafted Terry McLaurin earlier than that. I believe the third round out of Ohio State. What is the big picture of this Ohio or of this Washington receiving core entering the season? Yeah, I think it's a group where it's a lot of guys that with potential and it's a lot of guys that you really like. And uh, the whole thing I've said this whole offseason is that the receiver group is a group that if they had someone that stood out as a number one, you'd really like the rest of the guys. I think if everyone else was kind of down one spot on the depth chart, you'd say this is a really strong group. But they lack that one number one receiver that you can say, OK, we can rely on him. And we have all these other guys that if two or three of them hit their potential, we're, we're good. Um, you say Doxon has failed to live up to his expectations a little bit. I would say that's probably being quite generous. Um, he, <laughs> he, he, there, a lot of fans kind of want him done. There are some people that think that he's um, he's a trade candidate this off season um, at some point, um, and that he might. I don't think he gets cut. I I think he still makes the team um, unless someone makes a ridiculous trade offer for him, um, which seems unlikely. Um, but I'm not sure he's guaranteed his starting spot anymore. Um, he was playing X. Um, I think Terry McLaurin will probably take that spot. He has been he's been turning heads in, in training camp and, and everyone seems to sing his praises about how he is not just a speedster. He runs great routes um, yep. and he's, he's starting to understand how to um, change the tempo within his routes so that it's not just all speed he, he can sell speed and 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 change the tempo to really go an extra gear when he needs to um and calvin Harmon, as you mentioned as well they, they really like calvin Harmon, and he's been doing lots of extra work after practice he's been pulling aside josh norman and and dominic rogers cromartie some of those veterans in the secondary after practice to go over some things and um and and releases off the line of scrimmage and things like that so they like him as someone that could potentially play some z because um paul richardson has struggled with injuries um and then they have another guy to look out for um is cam sims who was undrafted out of okay. alabama a year ago um he made the final 53 last year and then on the literally the first play of the season he uh, got injured and was out for the whole season um so he's worked his way back and he's another one that's been making plenty of plays and um, getting talked about a lot. And uh, I would expect him not only to make the 53, but to challenge for some playing time. Interesting. All right. Well, let's get to the tight end group because we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, multiple tight end sets a little bit later in the show, but 
I've always admired the way that Jay Gruden has been able to use 12 and 13 personnel. I think he's been one of the best in the NFL over the last four or five years at doing just that. So when you look at this group, Jordan Reed, Vernon Davis, Jeremy Sprinkle, pretty good group from top to bottom. And it seems like Jordan Reed is, number one, he's got to stay healthy. But this summer, he's getting a lot of buzz in terms of what he's done so far at training camp. Yeah, for sure he has. He's been probably the most positive storyline of training camp is that he looks fully healthy. Um, and it's the first training camp in a couple of years where he has been fully healthy and, and ready to go from day one. He hasn't been having any sort of lingering injuries that he's been protecting or being held out of practice or anything like that. He's been able to go full speed from day one and it's shown. Like You see clips um, from training camp from one-on-ones and he beats Landon Collins, he beats... Monte Nicholson, he beats basically anyone that's one-on-one -on -one against him, um, as I'm sure the Eagles are very well yeah. versed with, um, and Malcolm Jenkins has had some good matchups with him, so um, yeah, Jordan Reed is definitely the, the highlight there, Vernon Davis, they love for his speed, um, he, he's not necessarily the quickness guy that he was any, um, when he was younger, but he's still got the long speed, even at his age, um, and then Jeremy Sprinkle, they like as a guy that is kind of He's been a bit of a developmental guy. He's more of a blocking tight end, but he offers some size um, and some physicality um, as a receiver. And he's sort of been talked about a little bit more this offseason than he has been previously. So um, they're hoping he's come along and, and then they can get him in there a little bit more often and spell Reed to make sure they keep him healthy. And then they have someone that they can trust as a blocker. Um, so when they go to those multiple tight end sets, as you said, they, they can trust and be a threat in the run game, not just you know, expect to spread out the defense and try to mismatch personnel. Yeah, this is a team that historically has been very good at mixing up their personnel groupings, doing different things from a tempo standpoint. Uh, when they go into 13 personnel, you've got Chris Thompson there, what they're able to do to create favorable matchups. Uh, Jay Gruden has been very good at that over the last few seasons. And if Jordan Reed is healthy, that gives them that extra dimension, that ability to do some things uh, in that realm, which will be fun to watch from an X and O standpoint uh, yeah. for that team. So that'll be very, very interesting. All right, we talked a little bit about the offensive line. No Trent Williams out. Obviously, Jerron Christian, the the second uh, the second year player out of Louisville, uh, currently slated as the starter at left tackle. Donald Penn, we'll see wh where he ends up, how long it takes him to get into that rotation. But let's talk about the rest of the line. Eric Flowers, you mentioned, was brought in to play left guard. Left tackle didn't work out for him in New York, in New York or uh, so far in Washington. So he is still slated as the starter at left guard. Then you've got Chase Roulie at center. Uh, then you've got Brandon Scherf, the uh, the Pro Bowl right guard, and then Morgan Moses at right tackle the offensive line is a pretty good group when healthy when you especially when you look at that right side yeah the right side is is kind of their um their foundation the sheriff and moses have been their their, their foundation for years um along with trent williams and and trace roulier um was a six round pick a few years ago and he's come along pretty well um and has cemented that center spot so when when those three are healthy they're, they're pretty happy with that side of the line um, left guard has been the problem spot for them for a number of years, and they've, they've had Sean Laval, who they like, and when he's healthy, mm. he plays well. He just was rarely healthy, so they decided to move on. Um, they tried Eric Flowers, um, or they wanted to try Eric Flowers, but he had to play tackle throughout all of the off-season activities so far, um, so he's only just learning to play guard now, um, and if I'm totally honest, I don't expect that to go well. Um, so I think the more likely thing to see there is rookie Wes Martin, the fourth-round pick, mm. Um, I think he will probably win the starting left guard job. Um, and I don't think he'll be flashy or anything like that. He's not going to be Brandon Sheriff making highlight blocks every week. But he'll be, hopefully for them, a solid piece that they can rely on. Um, at the moment, he's he, he did spend time working with the ones when Flowers was working at left tackle. Um, now Flowers is getting most of the reps with the ones at left guard. Um, but I, I think there's a little bit of they want Martin to sort of be paired with Donald Penn and Penn's working with the twos as he gets adjusted back to mm. playing football again so and Wes Martin's been working with the twos so I, I would expect at some point to see Penn and Martin kind of as a pair move up to the first team unit and with Rudier, Sheriff and Moses um, and I would think um, assuming that Trent Williams doesn't come back that is probably the starting offensive line in week one. 
All right, well, interesting. So some shuffling potentially for that matchup against a very good Eagles defensive line. Let's flip the script here. Let's go to the, the front seven. We've talked about that front three in their 3-4 scheme uh, and how great they are. Let's talk about those edge rushers, though. So uh, you bring back Ryan Kerrigan, savvy veteran. You've got a former second-round pick in Ryan Anderson out of Alabama. Those are the two listed starters, as you would expect, I would imagine, especially because the first-round pick, Montez Sweat, remember the team traded back up into round one. They took Montez Sweat out of Mississippi State to pair with Dwayne Haskins, the other first round pick. So uh, Montez Sweat, he's been, I think he's been bothered. Was it a calf injury? Something like that, yeah. a leg injury uh, throughout most of the summer. So he's not listed with the starting group as of now. Yeah, he's um, he's missed probably the last three or four days uh, with a calf injury. Um, and he's just starting to get back integrate, integrated now, um, sort of doing a few individual drills here and there. Um, and they they kind of are holding him out just to be precautious and, and they're hoping that he'll be fine for the first preseason game but um he should be fine come the season i don't think it's a long-term thing um and i would expect probably before long he would take that starting job off of ryan anderson um but yeah ryan anderson is slated to be the starter alongside kerrigan um kerrigan's been a guy everyone knows about kerrigan by now he's reliable for eight to ten sacks a season he's one of the better guys in the league to you know, trust for uh, positive numbers every year. Um, and Anderson is someone that they've been a little bit disappointed by what he's produced on the fields. Um, they, they like what, the, you know, the Alabama mentality that he brings to the locker room. Um, but he, he needs to show something as a pass rusher because that's mm. primarily his job. Uh, as a run defender, he's been outstanding. And that's what he was at Alabama. He could yep. set the edge. Nobody ran to his side. They all ran away from him. And when he's had chances um, to get on the field for the past few years in place of Preston Smith, um, whenever someone's run at his side, he's blown up the run. So he's he's good in that aspect, but he's just not offered anything as a pass rusher to, to date. Um, he's supposedly come in in better shape this year, but you say you hear that about just about everyone. Um, and so he needs he really needs to show something going into his third season as a pass rusher or as you know, Montez Sweat is kind of the guy that's going to take over eventually, um, and I expect that to be sooner rather than later. Do you imagine that uh, Sweat could be the starter by week one? Uh, I, yeah, I'm assuming he's healthy and the, this this calf thing doesn't linger on, and, and he's not held out for too much longer. I would think um, when I watched him on film, he was good. Enough, he was much better against the run than I thought, and, and that would be the reason why he wouldn't necessarily be a starter. If, if they were worried about him as a run defender. Um, but he was strong against the run, and, and he had multiple tackles for loss. So um, he he should, I would think, be perfectly fine at starting week one. A uh, huge overhaul at linebacker for this team. You know, they uh, they move on from Mason Foster late in the summer, right before training camp. They moved on from Zach Brown this offseason. He obviously signed here in Philadelphia. Uh, so you have a second-year player in Sean Dion Hamilton. Uh, he's listed as a starter alongside uh, John Bostic, a former second-round pick for the Chicago Bears. So you've got those two. They were hoping they'd have Reuben Foster. Uh, he was. It was announced that he would not be suspended for the year, and then he had, a, I believe it was a season-ending injury this spring. So he He's on the shelf, uh, and then they, like I said, they moved on from Mason Foster. So it seems like they're kind of pushing, putting all their eggs in the basket uh, with Sean Dion Hamilton and John Bostic. Is there anybody else that could kind of be an impact there, an impact player at least for Week One? Yeah, um, I, I think they they really like the rookie that they got um, on day three, Cole Holcomb, um, okay. out of uh, North Carolina, um, and he, uh, Jay Gruden, after the draft, specifically said that they loved what he had and I, I think he was one of Gruden's guys um and he was he would watch film of other players and and uh Holcomb would stand out as a guy that has ridiculous athleticism for a linebacker uh he he reportedly ran 4-4 four four at his pro day which is outstanding for a linebacker um and he had 100 tackles for all three of his seasons in uh, at college so uh, he was a reliable tackler he had good instincts versus the run he has the athletic traits to be a, a guy that can play all three downs um, whether he is that from week one I'm not sure I think as you said John Bostick and Sean Dean Hamilton are going to be the guys um, but Holcomb could be a guy that sort of the second time the Redskins meet the Eagles we could see Holcomb take over um, or at least play a role. Mm. Um, and, and they also have Josh Harvey Clemens, who right. was a former safety turned linebacker, and they kind of have used him as a as a matchup guy in, in dime packages. Yep. Um, so uh, he's someone that 
could see sometime he's he's buffed up a little bit um because he couldn't play the run at all he was not strong enough to play the run but he um he's buffed up a little bit this off season and, and they they like what they've got from him as well I have a hard time whenever I'm typing his name out, not saying Josh Harvey Clemson. Uh, that's a <laughs> side note with, uh, with with Josh Harvey Clemens. All right, let's get to the secondary. I want to group the corners and safeties together. Let me ask you this question. Going into the season for Washington, do you feel this secondary as a strength, a weakness, or do you think the kind of jury's out? And we'll just go through who are listed as the starters. Uh, Josh Norman and Quentin Dunbar at the outside corner. Fabian Morrow is the nickel. Landon Collins at strong safety. Monte Nicholson at free safety. When you look at this group as a whole, again, strength, weakness, or is the jury kind of out? Uh, the jury is kind of out. I, I'd lean a little bit toward, more towards strength. Um, okay. Landon Collins certainly um, was someone that they, they really liked and, and they were really happy to land him. And, and he seems to have assumed a leadership role and um, has fitted in seamlessly. Um, and Monte Nicholson at free safety, I, I wrote about him the other week. He's someone that if he just plays the post, he's or even in coverage. He yeah. developed last year as a coverage defender. Um, he's solid, but his tackling needs a lot of work. Um, and He's not been a reliable tackler for a while now, so he, he has to work on that. Um, so the jury's kind of out on him. Josh Norman, he hasn't lived up to the contract. Jay Gruden has said that he's probably not lived up to the contract that they paid him, but they're sure happy to have him on the team. He's still their top corner. They love what Quinton, Quinton Dunbar is before he got hurt last year. Um, he was probably their best corner before he got hurt last year. Um, and so he's been making plays throughout training camp, and he's someone that I think could be the future number one corner once Josh Norman is eventually moves on. Um, and then Fabian Moreau, I'm not sold on in the slot. Um, I think he's more of an outside guy. I think the rookie seventh rounder, Jimmy Moreland is someone that um, he's been making so many plays literally every day. There are multiple tweets about how he's been doing so well at training camp um, and getting interceptions. Um, and he's someone that I think could end up taking that nickel corner spot, perhaps not week one, um, I think he'll see the field at some point in week one, but I mm. think probably the, the second time they match up, I would think he would have claimed the nickel spot. Jimmy Moreland, just you know, having watched him at James Madison and having watched Josh Norman throughout his career, I feel like those are two guys cut from the same cloth. I, if Norman, yeah. th th if he's that kind of guy that take guys under his wing, I feel like Moreland and him would really kind of fit to, fit in together on the same field. Yeah, I, I I mean he's that sort of feisty, yeah. passionate guy. Um, he's a little bit undersized, but he he plays strong. He's not he doesn't shy away from any receiver. If they're six five or if they're five nine, he will go and press them at the line of scrimmage, and he will have a fight. Um, and it's a lot of fun to watch. All right, so let's uh, let's get. A, I'm going to ask this question a lot, and really as we preview every opponent. Uh, the Eagles are obviously going to be a big 12 personnel team this year with multiple tight ends, Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard. So one of the big questions we'll look to answer each week leading up to the game is how is the opponent going to match up to the Eagles when they go 12 personnel? So in your in your mind, having studied Washington and what they do from a schematic standpoint on defense, how do you feel that they will match up to Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard when those two guys are on the field at the same time? Yeah, it's a tough one. I would think they would still play base personnel against them, which okay. I imagine the Eagles would kind of like, um, because then they can, you know, motion spread guys out and even go to empty and, and try to find some matchups. But I'd imagine because those guys are decent enough blockers that, and, and the Eagles are a good threat to run the ball. Uh, and the Redskins defense under Jay Gruden has always been about stopping the run first and foremost. I'd imagine they would, tried to go with base personnel and then uh, and focus on taking away the run and then adjusting you know if if the eagles spread guys out um if if they go no um empty out of the backfields then you know they the, the redskins will adjust and probably play two high shell coverages yep. um or, or maybe they might try to match up they, they like what nicholson's able to do in man coverage um so they might try to match up nicholson on one guy and um maybe a josh harvey clemens or if cole holcomb comes along um or even if sean Dion hamilton he's looks decent in coverage maybe they can trust the linebacker in, in coverage on one and, and nicholson in coverage on another but i'd imagine it'll be mostly sort of two high shell zones or pattern matching um and base personnel if they were to go in that scenario and they were to try and man up, do you feel that it would be Josh Norman matched up with Deshaun and Dunbar matched up with Alshon? That's a 
Good question. Uh, they tend to leave Norman on his side. Yeah. So if if they have done, they've done better at letting Norman follow guys, but they still tend to leave him on that side. So I would think it will be kind of up to the Eagles to choose if they yep. if they want Jackson or if they want Jeffrey or Norman. I, I would think Norman would probably prefer to go against Jeffrey because mm. he likes those bigger guys that he can try to get his hands on rather than the quicker guys that he's not as fast as. So I would think Norman would prefer to follow Jeffrey, but um, given that they prefer to keep Norman on his side, I would think it would probably end up being Jackson on Norman more often than not. So what is Washington's identity going to be on defense this year? If you had to kind of sum it up and give us a quick elevator speech on uh, what their identity will be defensively entering this fall. Uh, the the defensive line um, or the defensive front is is the Alabama mentality of you know you you got to stop the run uh, make teams one dimensional um, and and then you know get after the passer it, the defense will go as far as that defensive line will take them and there's plenty of talent on the defensive line um, and they've got some talent in that secondary that we talked about that can hold up in coverage um, for long enough for that defensive line to get home but. I think it will go. The defense will be on the back of the defensive line, and and they'll go as far as that'll take them. And then the last question for you: What uh, going back to the other side of the ball? What will the bread or the bread and butter of this Washington offense be this fall? That will depend a lot on the quarterback. Yeah. Um, if if it's Colt McCoy as the starter, um, then it will be you know the whatever they want to run because Colt McCoy has been there for five years. He knows the system, um, and he has that kind of gunslinger mentality that. Jay Gruden likes, so it'll probably be more shotgun and uh, drop back passing and uh, and taking shots down the field. Case Keenum's kind of in a similar mentality, but he he doesn't have the experience in the offense, so it might be a little bit more restricted playbook. Um, but it'd be rather similar to McCoy. But if if Haskins takes over, which I imagine he will at some point, um, it will probably be the kind of default thing that most most teams do with a rookie quarterback, which is, you know, hand the ball off, trust the run game, rely on play action, and try to think, keep things as simple as possible um, and keep it in third manageable situations for the rookie. Well, Mark, this was outstanding and really a, a fun primer for the Eagles, uh, for Eagles fans as they prepare uh, for week one against the Washington Redskins. Really appreciate the time. And for those together, Mark jo is joining us now live from Sweden. Uh, he's over there. He's visiting uh, some friends in Sweden. So really appreciate Mark. Really appreciate the time here for joining us uh, on the chalk on Chalk Talk on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. No problem. Thanks for having me. Great stuff from Mark, and you could follow him just like I do on Twitter at Mark Bullock NFL. And while you're at it, I'm at FW3. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content. We're just starting to get geared up here on PhiladelphiaEagles.com. And for really appreciate everybody that goes on all platforms and social media and shares this show, shares the Journey to the Draft podcast. And really the, the number one way, though, to support the show, and I do appreciate Like I said, everyone that promotes this on social media, thank you. But if you go to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, you leave us a rating and leave us a comment. This is the time of year fans all around the globe are gearing up for NFL coverage. Now's the time. Give us a little bit of love. Give us a little bit of support. Go give us that rating. Give us a comment. And what that does is it boosts us up in the rankings, make us a little bit more visible for others that are looking for content just like this. So really appreciate everybody that is able to go and give us that kind of support. And I want to give some love to some of those that already have. And so uh, Matt checked in with a five-star review and a comment saying how much he's enjoying the training camp podcast so far uh, with Chris McPherson and Ben Fennel. It's been a lot of fun catching up with, all th uh, with those two guys every day here from training camp and breaking down Eagle pre-Eagles practices. A little bit of a different flavor right, than what we've done uh, in the past year on the show. Uh, so really appreciate Matt, you checking in. And then we've got RJ Field with a question. And the question is, Fran, with all the buzz around 12 and even 13 personnel, why do you think teams in college in the NFL don't use more two-back sets with so much talent there and the ability now for many backs to catch the ball either out wide or from the backfield? Also, seems like he could be an added weapon in read option schemes. Thank you. Well, RJ, I think we do see that. I think, number one, it's, it's hard to find backs that have that kind of skill set, right? I mean, you see that in the NFL now. I mean, we, the Eagles, uh, they trade for Jordan Howard this offseason. You look where Jordan Howard comes from. 
Chicago did a lot of tw- uh, 12 personnel or 21 personnel, excuse me, with two backs, one tight end a year ago, and even 20 personnel with two backs, no tight ends, three receivers, where Jordan Howard and Tariq Cohen, they're on the field at the same time, and you're trying to create some of those favorable matchups, namely to get Tariq Cohen the ball in space. They drafted David Montgomery this year in the third round, despite having Tariq Cohen, because they want to keep that going, right? So I think uh, that's something we'll continue to see there. We've seen that in the past in New Orleans. We've seen it in New England. Uh, we'll see it, I think, in Denver this year a little bit. We'll see that all around the NFL and teams that have that ability. We'll see it in Washington. Uh, we talked about that earlier with Mark. When you, you have a guy like Chris Thompson, you can get creative with the different things that they that they that you can do with him. And I think uh, Jay Gruden is one of those guys. So number one, it's about acquiring that guy. And then number two, yeah, you have to be able to have that the, the ability to install those kind of schemes into your offense. And, and all coaches are good. All coaches find ways to do it. Uh, that's what they spend the whole offseason doing is kind of figuring out ways uh, to add dimensions, add layers to their offense, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's something you do see from around the NFL. I think now 12 personnel is becoming such a buzzword, and we're seeing it more um, because of some of these hybrid tight ends that we're seeing, but no, they, they, trust me, 21 personnel, you know, 20 personnel, those two back sets are definitely prevalent. You do see it both in college and in the NFL, uh, and it, it can be lethal. I will say this, though, it can be a little bit more predictable because with two tight ends on the field, you don't know if it's run pass, right? I mean, when it, when it's when, when you have two backs on the field, yeah, it could it could be a run, um, you know, but it could also it's probably more geared towards a passing down, right? Because you know if you're if you're Chicago and you have uh, you have uh, Jordan Howard and Tariq Cohen. You know, you probably don't want Tariq Cohen being used as a blocker. And so they, you want to make sure that you try and stay uh, 50-50 run pass as best as possible in those groups. And that's what that's really what makes those groups really dynamic, right? Is if you can line up in that personnel grouping and the defense doesn't know if it's a run or a pass. It's probably a little bit easier to mask that with a tight end as opposed to an extra back. But teams are always going to try and find those favorable matchups, find ways to get those guys in space. And uh, I would expect, yeah, te- teams that have that ability to go 20 one personnel or you know or 20 personnel they're going to find ways to do it. So uh, great question there from RJ and uh, great stuff from Mark Bullock today. Really appreciate again, like I said, him joining us this week for Chalk Talk, but I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Novacare Complex, I'm Fran Duffy. We'll talk to you soon.